This is a lecture series focused on dialectical thinking that will be told in three parts. The first part focuses on origins of the search for truth and its consequences for fundamental theory. The second part focuses on the principle of dialectical negativity and the beyond of religion and science. The third part focuses on the real in itself, Hegel's system and its final frontier. In this video, we'll be focusing on part one, origins of the search for truth and consequences for fundamental theory. In order to understand the origin of dialectics, we have to understand why it was necessary in the first place. Dialectics became necessary because of a problem of truth, namely that people claim to know the truth in an absolute way, but that these absolute claims to truth were internally contradictory in regards to the realm of other subjects. Moreover, this claim to absolute truth tended to elevate a subject above temporal relative discursive processes, processes like argumentation, reason, and regular normative discourse. In these processes, how are we to discern the truth from mere opinion? How are we to know what is true? Dialectics is thus a foundational logical exercise in order to mediate the truth in temporal appearances. Subjects would attempt to do this by discussing, arguing, and coming to some conclusion about the nature of truth. This could be achieved by self-reflectively identifying contradictions internal to one's own truthful position, or identifying the way in which a position could be incoherent. Finally, by identifying the way in which one's truthful position could have a opposite point of view. Thus, for a dialectical subject, if someone came to them claiming to have absolute truth, independent of discussion and argumentation, claiming that their view was contradiction-free, totally coherent, and internally one with no opposite, then this would be a subject that had totally identified with an absolute body of knowledge that was anti-dialectical. Thus, the dialectician would set to work identifying contradictions internal to this absolute body of knowledge. What contradiction would corrode the positive knowledge from within? What is the condition upon which this knowledge loses sense? What is the opposite point of view to this knowledge? The result was astounding, that there was actually no consistent or coherent absolute view of reality. In other words, in challenging the absolute view of reality, dialectics came to the conclusion that there was no such thing as an absolute, and that all positions were in fact historical, historically mediated by discussion between different subjectivities. Consequently, if a subject still holds on to an absolute point of view, the dialectician seems to view this as a type of ideological phantasmatic mask, a mask obfuscating the fact that there is no absolute reality. How are we to make sense of this conclusion? If there is no absolute reality and everything is historically mediated, how are we to discern between truth and opinion? The problem of truth and opinion, in fact, structured most of human history. In the ancient world, there was no well-grounded dialectical mechanism to discern between truth and opinion. In fact, most civilizations presupposed a type of non-dialectical absolute reality, for example, in the notion of a transcendental god. God was a figure that a historical human subject could rely on in prayer, that could ask for help independent of other subjects with their arguing and their reasons and their discourse, and be recognized by such an absolute reality. Moreover, this absolute reality could be inscribed into political processes, like in the divine right of kings, and structure entire civilizations. This is foreign to the modern philosophical landscape. Starting with Immanuel Kant, the modern philosophical landscape dialecticizes the absolute, presupposing its existence, but claiming that we have no direct access to it, as in a subject of prayer 
or in a king who claims divine knowledge. Instead, Kant dialecticizes this absolute with recourse to the distinction between phenomena and noumena. Phenomena are human abstractions and perceptions, our reason and the way we structure the categories of the understanding. Noumena, on the other hand, is external, independent of human reality, unknowable fundamentally, but nonetheless positively existing as a reality. One way to think about the distinction between phenomena and noumena is in relationship to the sense perceptions and the things in themselves. For Kant, we can see, smell, taste, touch, and hear things in the external world, but we do not reach, through these sense perceptions, the thing in itself. The thing in itself positively exists, but our sense perceptions do not give us access. In other words, we are barred from accessing the thing in itself. We are stuck within our perceptions and our abstractions, and this is what we can dialecticize. But the absolute noumenal reality is non-dialectical and foreign to our experience. Thus, one can say that Kant introduces a type of anthropology, an anthropology of perceptions and abstractions focused on our reason, our understanding, and the categories we construct, which are subject to argumentation, discourse, and critique. Through these mechanisms, we can get a better and better understanding of what is external, independent, and unknowable fundamentally, but we will never understand the thing as it is in itself, only through a distorted sense perception and relative abstraction. Thus, this brings us back to the fact that dialectics focuses on contradictions, incoherence, and opposition of our knowledge. Thus, our knowledge gives us no access to the absolute reality as it is in itself, but rather just to the way in which we perceive and abstract this reality. What we perceive and abstract of this reality is historical. But what is invariant of these perceptions and these abstractions are the antinomies of reason. In other words, the contradictions, the incoherence, and the opposition is all that is invariant to the historical process. From this understanding, we reach an incredibly important turning point in the history of philosophy between the work of Immanuel Kant and the work of George Hegel. In this distinction between Kant and Hegel, we have an important distinction in regards to the absolute noumenal reality and the things in themselves. As we just discussed, for Kant, his dialectic operationalizes the distinction between human phenomena, our perceptions and abstractions, and the absolute noumena, or the things in themselves. However, here Hegel does not introduce any new difference to this scheme, but rather offers a perspectival shift on this very distinction. Claiming that the absolute noumena of Kant, or the things in themselves, independent of human reality, is in fact a product of human phenomena, and a presupposition of human phenomena. Thus, in response to Kant, Hegel operationalizes a type of Occam's razor, claiming that it is simpler to assume that the absolute noumenal reality is a presupposition of human phenomena and not a reality independent of human phenomena. In what is now recognized as a classic Hegelian reversal, what was once seen as a in itself is transformed into a for us. In other words, the noumenal in itself that is impossible for us to reach becomes something that is phenomenally for us. The distinction is a distinction that makes a huge difference. What was conceived in Kant's system as an impossible outside that we would never reach all of a sudden becomes the most close and intimate phenomena of our abstractions and perceptions. Consequently, for Hegel, the antinomies of reason are still invariant, but again we get a perspectival shift on the nature of contradictions, incoherence, and opposition. Whereas for Kant, contradictions, incoherence, and opposition were a sign that we were at a distance from the thing in itself. For Hegel, 
contradictions, incoherence, and opposition, were a sign that we were unified with the becoming of the thing in itself internal to phenomenal history. Thus, we also get a perspectival shift on the ancient dialectic as a logical exercise in itself. When historical subjects come together to try to work through their incoherent views, identify contradictions, and reconcile oppositional determinations, far from being at a distance from the thing in itself, for Hegel, this was the very work that unified these subjects with the becoming of the thing in itself as a historical work over and above the subjects who would put up a mask as an ideological defense. This point is so important that it is worth spelling out and repeating. When the subject is actively working with and actively striving to embody contradiction, incoherence, and opposition as a positive feature, Hegel claims that the subject is mediating the becoming of the thing in itself. As a result, the historical work of such activity is the thing in itself not as a perfect absolute reality beyond or behind appearances, but as an absolute tension internal to our perceptions and internal to our discourse. From this philosophical understanding, we can come to a type of dialectical or psychological diagnosis of those subjects who claim to know the absolute truth. What these subjects are doing is in fact trying to psychologically escape from the historical work of tension, they are trying to not reach the absolute thing in itself, but actually block or distort their access to the thing in itself and participate with the other subjects who are all a part of the phenomenal spiritual history. Now that we have covered the philosophy of the origins of the search for truth and the role of dialectics, we can pass on to contemporary fundamental theory where oftentimes we do have a naive understanding of the thing in itself or the noumenal reality, whether that is inscribed in the abstractions of mechanical theory, quantum theory, complexity theory, evolutionary theory, and so forth and so on, there is a presupposition that we know the thing. Of course, in the philosophical transition from Kant to Hegel, where the noumenal is first barred, leaving us interacting with the antinomies of reason. But then Hegel simply does a perspectival shift and helps us realize that these very antinomies of reason are giving us direct access to the thing. Such a logic is not inscribed into the fundamental understanding of the thing in itself as it relates to contemporary fundamental theory, where a pre-Socratic knowing tends to operate between those who are engaged in the theory where they claim that they have a truth of the thing. Moreover, they are also operating on a type of pre-Kantian noumena, where they believe that their abstractions are directly unified or symmetrically aligned with the thing in itself. What tends to result are the formation of ideological bubbles, and as a consequence, the unity of the field in a historical tension is not properly recognized. If the truth of the field as a historical tension was properly recognized, we would be able to confront some fundamental problems in all of the major fields of study that we are currently dealing with more of an ideological illusion. For example, if we were assuming the Socratic position that there is no absolute position, the Kantian position that what we are interacting with are rational antinomies, and the Hegelian position that these same rational antinomies give us access to the thing in itself, then we would be able to confront the problems of science and the humanities, the problems of the transition from the classical to the quantum world, and also the problem of applying evolutionary theory to the human world. Let's analyze each of these three dimensions in turn. When we look at the difference between the sciences and the humanities, through the lens of contradiction and opposition, we see that on the side of the sciences, there is this presupposition of a reality independent of humans, and on the side of the humanities, this attempt to understand human subjective reality, which structures the entire field. When it comes to classical and quantum physics, what we see as a major problem is an attempt to understand physics inclusive of the nature of observers and also inclusive of the 
fundamental temporality of reality as opposed to an absolute space-time. Finally, when it comes to applying evolutionary theory to human reality, we often run into another fundamental opposition between those who would reduce human behavior to biological reductionist paradigms and those who would prefer an emergentist paradigm where socio-cultural reality takes primacy. What brings all of these problems into a type of unity is the understanding that fundamental theory is about the nature of abstractions and not about some noumenal substance that pre-exists the abstractions. The abstractions themselves and their antinomies are what we are mediating in regards to the thing in itself, in regards to their internal contradictions, their incoherent views, and their oppositional determinations. All such antinomies are a feature of the becoming of the thing in itself in regards to the distinction between sciences and the humanities, in regards to the transition from the classical to the quantum, in regards to the difference between the biological and the socio-cultural, and even in regards to the theological and the secular. Thus, how we should approach a field in this unified tension is in regards to a type of dialectical transformation. When we're talking about dialectical transformation, the sciences and the humanities, for example, or the classical to the quantum transition, or even human evolution itself, will not be abstractions that stay with us forever, but in dialectical mediation become something totally new, become something totally different. Thus the truth of all of these positions will be in their dissolution and not in their ideological eternity. Again, the only eternity in dialectics is really in the antinomies of reason which were first seen as barring us from the absolute and were then seen as unifying us with the absolute. Thus, in ideological capture, where there are subjects who believe that the knowledge we already possess is fine the way it is, and where subjective identification with this knowledge is demanded as an education, there is a type of obfuscation of the truth. The truth is again being mediated as a tension. Accepting this tension and growing with this tension should be the point of real education. Thus, the more mindful we are of our own bodies and our own minds and the way in which we handle conflict, opposition, incoherence, and contradiction, the better we will get at mediating the thing in itself. This brings us far away from the pre-modern and the pre-dialectical notion of an absolute reality independent of subjectivity, and brings us towards an understanding of absolute reality that is inclusive of subjective reality and our own subjective spiritual growth. And that was the first lecture on dialectical thinking, part one, origins of the search for truth and consequences for fundamental theory. Now, if you benefited from this work, you can find ways to support me through patreon.com and paypal.me. I also want to give a special thanks to all of the Patreons who have been supporting me throughout this journey. Your support means the world to me. Thanks so much, and see you for the second lecture.